Hi Stronghold family, my name is Kalila Williams and I'll be doing the weekly announcements. Mikkel Frazier and Aaliyah Mason Frazier had a baby boy named Brendan Jabari Frazier, born June 19, 2024, at 6 pounds, 13 ounces, and 19.2 inches long. The Comforters Ministry presents walking alongside children and teens as they grieve. Check out this video, please. Hey, Stronghold, Takora here, and I'm here to invite you out on July the 2nd to our Comforters Ministry. We will be discussing walking alongside children and teens that are grieving. Our young people and our youth today are, in a sense, how hopeless. They are sad, they are lonely, they are experiencing sometimes identity crisis. They just need someone to be beside them, to walk beside them, to just be their friend, to be a great listening ear, to to feel like people, like we as adults, want to know their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions. They just want to feel heard. So come out on July the 2nd to hear tips on how to be there for these young people, all the way from infancy, all the way up into teenage years. People, these young people are experiencing grief at an overwhelming sense, and us as older individuals really need to learn how to be there for them, learn how to disciple them, learn how to guide them, learn how to walk beside them. That is what we are called to do, to be disciples to these young people. So we really hope to see you on July the 2nd at 7 p.m. on Zoom as we talk about walking alongside children and teens. We hope to see you there. Bye. There is no Bible study this Wednesday, July 3rd. The church building will be closed Thursday, July 4th and Friday, July 5th for building maintenance. Please join the youth for a youth design workshop as they design the new youth worship center and explore and uncover who they are in Christ on Sunday, July 14th and July 21st at 1.30 p.m. The Pearls of Grace Women's Ministry invites you to the In Honor of Women Worship Service Sunday, July 14th at 5 o'clock p.m. The guest speaker is Hilary Chavez, First Lady of Victory Baptist Church. The Singles Ministry in Motion is sponsoring a beach trip to Ocean City, Maryland, Saturday, August 24th. The cost is $117 and it includes dinner and an all-you-can-eat bonfire restaurant. Transportation will be provided Register on Realm starting today. Limited seating. Calling all men to meet in the Adulam Cave at the Men's Retreat, October 11th to the 13th, Friday to Sunday. We are now accepting registration for the Men's Retreat after the first service outside of Room 115 and after the second service in the Administration Office. That was the weekly announcements. Again, my name is Kalila Williams, and thank you so much, and have a wonderful, blessed week.
cannot stop. Come, Lord Jesus, come, as my grandmama would say. Good to see you and good to be here. Thank God for all of you. For all of our visitors that are with us today, welcome. So excited to have you. We thank God for you. And for all you who are watching at home, we certainly continue to pray for you, for especially our sick and shut in, our bereaved. We are praying for you and holding you up as you meet God at that intersection of his will and your situation. Prayer matters, and so we're praying for you. I thank you for you. Continue to pray for Nicole. She won't be with us a day. Today is not a great day, so today she's going to be home. But she's watching at home. Hey, baby. Um, my bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Best thing that God ever, ever, ever did was tell me about this little girl named Nikki standing outside of room 210 in a red two-piece suit looking fly as apple pie. I said, hey. I said, hey. And, and the rest, four kids, three houses, some dogs later, it's been nothing but a blessing. Amen. We're about to enter into, uh, we want to thank God. We want to enter into, uh, we're about to shift it to another quarter of prayer. And, and this week we got, I know Pastor Bell and I got some special times of prayer that are planned. And we also know that, um, look up. Look up. God is about to open doors. But let's look back for a second because he said a shift was coming. Did anybody see a shift? That's the question. Did anybody see a shift? I saw a shift. I saw some stuff move. Look, the city, listen, listen, listen. I was at a thing yesterday. The mayor was there, and, and uh, she was outlining some things. Yes. Homicides in Philadelphia down. Youth homicides down. Overall violence down. And we now lead the nation in a reduction. Although everywhere is down, we lead the nation. Now, I don't know, listen. But that wasn't what did it for me. What did it for me was when I saw the mayor and the police commissioner get on national TV and say, yes, yes. would you pray? Yes. Oh, I want to hear leaders who want to call on the name of God to make a difference in what they're going. We're at the end of our rope. We ain't got nowhere else to go, but I would you please call on the name yes. The one who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. I ain't got it in me. I'm a praying man, she said. Hey! A shift is coming because I don't remember the last mayor ever asking me to pray about nothing, but this one said, Would you meet me at the altar? A shift. It's coming. Yes, Lord. You better bless God because we see him on the move. And praise God for the vision that Pastor had to set that free. That prayer is the difference maker. It's a blessing, amen? I saw some other shifts. I'm a, look, look, real quick. If you, if you worked at the carnival, stand up. VBS, if you worked VBS this week, stand up. If you did a short-term missions trip, stand up. That's a shift. You don't even know you was in the middle of the shift. You was being shifted. You didn't know. Sometimes the earth got a quake all around you. Y'all can be seated. We gave out hundreds of Bibles, hundreds of prayer requests. A shift is what that is. Amen? Amen. So listen, um, please come back tonight for baptism. As we, I think we have almost 20 or 30 people being baptized tonight. <laughs> and here's one more example of the testimony of God is that we have so many people being baptized. We actually have to have the next service again next month. The outdoor baptism will still be on next month because they're here. You know, music ministry had a concert and 15 people got saved. Shit. I'm, that, that ain't got nothing to do with the sermon today. I just want y'all to know that ain't got nothing to do 
with the sermon, God just said, put that in there. Let's pray. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, in the same way, when you were younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you, and clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Eternal God, as we today come and meet you at the intersection, God, of your will in our hearts, would you open our hearts towards you? Would you humble us and call us to holiness? Would you equip us to achieve the things the Lord you set in place for us? Would you today empty me of myself and let me be nothing that you might be everything, oh God? When we're honest, we stand in desperate need of you. We gather here each week, maybe looking good, but broken vessels in need of a God who would put us together and heal the parts that no one sees. All the fanciness and all the adornment doesn't mean anything. Lord, it's open scandal in heaven, the brokenness of who we are. But we've seen what you do in our weakness. Then you are made perfect. Would you perfect yourself today through your word, if it be your will? We ask in that match the name of Jesus. Church, say amen. 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 <clears throat> I'm going to pick up where I left off. If you remember, I preached a few weeks ago, and I preached from 1 Peter. 1 Peter, but I went to the end, 1 Peter 5, and there we talked about the call of the humble servant. That meant a lot. We talked a lot about, really, the internal perspective of what happens in the church of God calling us to humble ourselves, to get over ourselves, to even deal with some of the more challenging things about being in the church, about serving the church. We talk about church hurt. And I know some of y'all, that hit you because you told me, hey. And the challenge there from Peter was get over it. Not get over it so harshly, but understand that that's going to happen because we're living in Babylon. And, and Peter writes because he's writing to the churches of Asia Minor, the Roman Empire, and it is Babylon, and he uses the word Babylon because he wants people to understand. It's surrounded by wickedness. Anybody know anything about living in Babylon? I mean, all you got to do is turn on the news, the national news, the local news, the news you choose, don't matter. All of it seems to have a certain level of Babylonian-like behavior to it. Who shot who? Who hurt whose? Who's sleeping with whose? Who? Who, who? You could just go on and on. And if you think about how rapid, my brother and I were talking yesterday, how we grew up with, we didn't have the exposure to social media and the things and the amount of stuff that our kids absorb today. What's in the hands of the palms of a 12 and a 13 and a 14 year old is insane. I mean, I grew up and we played this game called Ringo, which was like big hide and go seek in the neighborhood. And you stayed outside till the street lights came on and then you better be on the stoop until mama said come in. Now that's how we grew up. I, I know, I know. And anybody on the block could whip your tail. It, the, not anybody, but that was at least four people on that block. I can name them. Miss Nellie, Miss Burt, Miss Yvonne, and my mama. They could give anybody a spanking. That world has changed drastically. And God and what Peter says is, in the same way Peter is writing to this place in which Christians and Jews and new converts are under great persecution for who they are. And there's a fear and a temptation to not stand out, to want to hide because you risk your life, your money, your home. And he has the nerve to call them and say, humble yourself. Be holy. Oh, what you mean be holy? You want me to tell the master in the house where I live I can't worship what he wants me to worship. He going to kick me out. I'm going to lose my job. Peter says, I'm going to give you some lessons on what I want you to do. I want you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and understand yourself. And I would dare to tell you that the gay God is looking at the church and asking us to find a pathway in the midst of Babylon to be holy.
and to be humble. And humbleness ultimately yields itself or it is created because we come in contact with the holiness of God. You, you, what I mean by that is, listen, it's one thing to be humble by your situation, your circumstances, because I grew up with not a lot. You know, we grew up, our, our money had color, and it wasn't green. It was purple and blue. And if the lecture bill was due, you can make that purple money into green money. It's just going to cost you. But you knew, come on now. I know I'm only talking to this side of the house over here. Gene, it's on, we it. But that ain't everybody up in here. Some of y'all, some of y'all silver spoon black folk, y'all don't know them. But I'm saying, that's one kind of humble. But there's another type of humble when you arrive before God and you recognize his holiness. And in understanding his holiness, then your heart somehow becomes a little weakened. And you say, you know, I don't really matter as much as I think I do. Dare I tell you that living in Babylon is a great place to encounter that type of calling for holiness and the humbling of our hearts. And that's why Peter writes this to them. He wants them to understand, I understand your circumstance. I understand the situation. I understand the block you live on. Only you and three other people own that house on that block. Everybody else renting. And I'm not saying nothing about rentals on this. Listen. But I understand it's not what it used to be. And it doesn't feel as stable. But if you, and if you go in and all you do is lock your doors and put your steel gates up and make sure everything's down, you got your, your ring doorbell and this alarm, you got the camera, you watching the camera, make sure ain't nobody touch your Amazon package. <laughs> And God is saying, but hold on. I understand you're in Babylon. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Because there's something out there I want from you. So dare I call you to do a five-day Bible club on the stoop of your house on the block with all them bad kids. That's what Peter's saying, though. Humble yourself under this mighty hand, this plan of God that don't feel so good. Anybody ever realize God puts you in places that don't feel so good? I mean, man, oh man, God got a way of tightening that belt till you feel like you're about to choke. <laughs> but when you have that experience, and like Peter, you fall in love with the plan of God, and it calls you deeper and deeper and deeper in. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I watched y'all at the carnival. And that VBS, serving and giving of yourself. This Peter, this letter he writes to the Babylon, he wants them to understand, listen, there's some things you got to walk away with. You got to know that there's some shared calling and some, you got a shared faith. You got a shared future. And he wants to understand that God's got a plan, and so don't get too confused by that. Look up. Doors are open. So from there, I wanted you to do something. So often when we open up the Bible, we read the Bible from the perspective of the listener. <clears throat> what I mean is that if I say you, therefore, rid yourself of all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy, we tend to read that from the perspective of I need to go rid myself of these things, things, and things. And which means that when I have gotten rid of those things, maybe that doesn't. <clears throat> but sometimes God is asking us to read the Bible from the perspective also of the writer. So sometimes God may want you to be Peter and not just be, be on both sides of the argument. Today I'm going to ask you if you would dare to venture to say, what if my job today is to be Peter and I'm writing or I'm casting a plan, a desire, a vision into Babylon? I don't get to sit here and just take it all in. I'm actually now got to be the person that says, hold on, maybe I got to go on that short-term mission trip. Maybe I got to serve in that space. Maybe I've got to be the person who sees the need and now I'm going. Y'all got quiet on me. I just want y'all to know. <clears throat> y'all got a little quiet on me. Pastor Kim was here. Hey, Pastor Kim. 
I knew that he's been hanging out at my house. <laughs> Talk about things God calls you to have to do. Maybe God wants you in Mexico or in Liberia. Maybe he wants us to be the person going into the Babylon. And if we don't read it that way, then we may miss the opportunity to be on both sides of the argument that we're both understanding that God is up to something big. We get to participate in it. And at the same time, he's calling us to act and do. So be on both sides. But as you absorb it, absorb both ends of the argument. See what Peter is saying and think that you may need to be the Peter. And at the same time, See, he's been, this is Peter, Simon, I call you Petra, upon this rock, this living stone, I shall build my church. You are the stones. <clears throat> Peter wants us to wrap our head around this idea that there's a setting in which we often live, act, and behave. And when you think about settings, think about it this way, who's the who, the what, and the when might be what you consider the setting of the text, the who we are, and, and I'm not talking about the, t I'm talking about us now, like who we are, what's the culture and the church, and are we a missional church, are we a traditional, what are we? And then based on who we are, then what are we supposed to be doing? What's the calling? This is a great passage, Acts 1a, you know this passage, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. That missional call, is that who we are? Yeah. Is that what we do? Because if you came here and you thought that maybe we were a traditional church, that we were just like going to sing some songs, have some church, going home, see you on Sunday, you might have walked down the wrong aisle. This, this ain't that kind of place. You know, this joint is jumping for Jesus. But it's not that kind of environment. So the who and the what. And then the when, the actual placement, like the, 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 the placement, the community, the times that we're living in, that's all stuff that you have to think about when you say, well, hold on. If I'm going to do what Peter says, I'm going to live in Babylon, i got to recognize the setting that I'm in. And I would dare to tell you that if you're in 19143, 19131, you got to know what we're dealing with. Yeah. Some of the most dangerous, some of the poorest, some of the smartest, some of the most talented yeah. black folk in Philadelphia. 19143, 19131. What's that? 19151. They're all together. <clears throat> this is who we are. Mm -hmm. The good, the bad, and the ugly, all in here. Right. Yeah. And if we're honest with ourselves, some of us have been the good, the bad, and the ugly over our time. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't always, I'll get to that. <clears throat> But I am concerned and possibly that the church, like the church that Peter is trying to get to, may be going through an identity crisis. We may be forgetting the kind of who we are. We don't seem to know the answers to the most critical questions and some of the fundamental things that we run from. It's easy to show up here on Sunday. But show up at that youth retreat at 9 o'clock at night when them kids going crazy. And when they're not members of the church and they don't know all the scriptures and mom and daddy ain't coming to pick them up, mom and daddy might not be able to come pick them up. Does the church have an identity crisis? Do we, do we understand our purpose? Do we understand that acts one thing, that we're to be going out of this place? I did not expect a lot of amens today. I don't expect anybody to be jumping up. And I keep asking God, can I get one of them happy sermons? He keeps laughing at me. <clears throat> I think it makes him happy when I ask. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 17 and 19 says this. So I tell you this and insist on in the Lord that you no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of their ignorance. That is due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Does that describe the Babylon we live in? Yes. Can you see Philadelphia in that passage? See, I can see it. I can see 19131 in that passage. And I'm not, I can see it. I can see it. It's next door. It's down the street. I, I, 
And, and if I'm not careful, and, and let me be careful, I don't want anyone to think I'm trying to criticize a space, a time, or a group of people. Just because you live in 3-1, that's not saying that's you. I'm saying that when we think about the experience that we're having, yeah. The police commissioner told me there, we talk about the entire city. There are five sections of the city that have the most violent spaces in the city. We talk a lot about Kensington. Do you know the, the number one, the loss of drugs and drug addiction is not really just happening in Kensington. Y'all do know that it's showing up in every home, cousins. It's the 27-year-old cousin who passed away suddenly and nobody talks about what happened. That's not happening just in Kensington. That's the person who had a work injury, got addicted to drugs, and they now, and that's the, that's, that's not happening all, that's happening next door, down the street, around the corner, the person that you passed by that day who's going tomorrow, that's, the, those are real people, and so the real issues of Babylon are surrounding us, they're next to us, and if we're not careful, we could be like those Christians that Peter's trying to explain. We could get to the place where we're no longer humble, we're just kind of focused on this artificial holiness, where we look so good. And everybody else doesn't really matter. And that artificial holiness isn't going to do anything when it comes to a God who is coming back one day to redeem those who he has elected. You're walking past the elect of God sometimes, and God may be saying like Peter is saying, live a life that is holy before them, that they might understand and see your good deeds. And in doing so, you will glorify God. And as you glorify God, I will call them to myself. That might be what God is asking of the church. So when you move away from whether the church has an identity crisis, you got to ask the obvious question, do you have an identity crisis? Do I have an identity crisis? You know, assistant pastor, do you have one? Do pastors have them? You know? Have we gotten so sophisticated and so elite with all our degrees and all our memorization of scripture that we might be missing the average thing that they did? It was the reason why he chose fishermen. We better be careful that we don't write so many books. The reason I ask the question is because if the church is really not a building, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, and 28, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, each of you as is a member of it. See, the, the church is not the building. This is really just a framework where we gather back to give testimony to who God is, get powered and inspired to do the next thing. But this is really, the, the church is the individual gathering of all of us. And when we gather, when we do that, then he is honored by our behavior. So the church, the, the sick as you are, you, if you, look at every, the weakest vessel in the house is the weakness of the church. That's why you can't be a little bit of church. Church ain't a bi-weekly every three days. It ain't, that ain't what. <laughs> yes. Peter says to them, you're going to have to live a different life. Live a life in which church is like family. We're you're the best of who we are, where we depend upon one another day in and day out. It's where I talked about before, where I can actually be transparent about my failures because the person next door to me is walking that same walk and has been down that path and they can show me the way. There's a light shining in the darkness. I've not yet comprehended it, but they have. Show me the way. That's what church is. And so if we're going to be this collective thing, and see, Peter wanted them to know, you, if you're going to be strong in the midst of all this suffering, all these challenges, what you have to become is all the more unit. That's why the carnival was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if we made a dime for Alpha on the carnival. The amazing thing about the carnival was to watch and see the hand of God. I watched God hold back weather and rain. Yeah. I watch people walk up to that prayer wall and be transparent with people they ain't never met and lay it out before them. This is what's going on in my life. 
I watch mothers and fathers hold hand in hand taking pictures of their kids and I watch people who we might not always like to watch but I said hold on God is up to something because they would have never set foot in that parking lot before but you're here today and I'm praying over you I'm putting I'm touching listen that carnival was a move of God And if we become more and more of that, then that's when God is all the more glorified. So Peter is casting and thinking and says, if the church is going to be what it needs to be, you got to know who you are and what you are and why you are. And there's actually some more why questions in there. I'm not going to do all of them. I wasn't trying to make a 17-point sermon. We're going to get through four quick points, and I'm going to get you out of here. But we're going to talk about who you are. Like, who are we? What does God want from us? How did we become that? How did they become what God is talking about? And then when will deliverance come? Because there is hope on the other end of this thing. It's kind of the, and, and Peter is, he's laying on in the first couple chapters this understanding for them to know that they're among the elects of God. He says in 1 Peter 1, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to, to God's elect, to the exiles scattered throughout the providence of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowing of God the Father through the sanctifying of the Spirit to be obedient to Christ and sprinkled with the blood. Peter starts off back in the first chapter. He begins the letter by telling you, I want you to understand that you're among the elect of God. God chose you. I think Chloe talked about that. She said God knew her before. Yeah. He knew he needed a Chloe. Amen. He knew he needed her to be able to sing. He knew all of that before. Before Joyce knew it, before Robin knew it, he knew yeah. what he needed yeah. to glorify him. That's amongst all of us. See, God can't be one thing and not. God has to be holy, righteous, all-knowing. If he's all of those things, then he had to know those who he, we are elect because God who is who he is. He can't not know who we are. So you can't pick and choose the attributes of God. You can't turn off that one, oh, well, I don't understand how God could choose us. Well, God loves us. And because he loves us, he gave us free will. We have will to choose, but he has the right to know. God doesn't stop being who he is because we want to be who we are. Now, why does that matter? The reason Peter starts is he wants to understand the power that goes along with your calling. The power that is underneath, that undergirds why you are where you are. It's not by happenstance you land up in this church, in this place, at this time. And all you are meeting God at the intersection of his will. You don't alter God. You're meeting him at the alteration of will that he's decided. He's the one who is sewing the gown for the bride. He's putting stitch by stitch. You better thank God you just wanted the stitches. And... So who are we? First Peter 2, 9, the A verse says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8 says, it was not because you were more in number than any of the other people in the, that the Lord had set his love on. On chosen and chose you for you were the fewest of all the people. But it was because of the Lord's love. This is the loving initiative by which God saved you in Jesus Christ. God calls you. He says you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Let's dwell on this idea of who you are, this idea of you being a royal priesthood. Let's just park there. Now, you all understood the priesthood. The priesthood was the, you, you didn't go into God unless you had the authority that was given to you by being born into the nation of Levi. That's where the priests were, and you were required, and you did the work. But Jesus comes, and he fractures that and changes all of those things. And when Jesus changes it, he comes as a priest of the order of Mount Sheznik, the prince of peace, the king of peace. He comes a king of Salem. And so when he says you're a royal priesthood, he's telling you, you get to go now freely to and from before God to deliver those things that God would have delivered. You get to go back and forth. So on your block, 
you don't realize it, but you the royal priest on that block. And you get to go to and from before God, asking him and begging of him that he would intersect and you would meet him at the point where his will might alter to save a child, change a mother, deliver a person from drug. You're the person God is calling. You're a royal priest. I know you don't look so royal. I know you ain't got crowns and gowns. Some of y'all do, but I know you ain't got all that. But he is saying, you, don't you understand who you are in the midst of all the suffering, all of Babylon? Don't you understand that you are a royal priest? And because of that, you are also a holy nation. Because you now have come and surrendered your life to me, you're now equipped to live a life that is different than others. Royal priests are granted permission. Early on, he says, if you go right up to the fourth verse, go up to the fourth verse, 1 Peter 2, 4. 1 Peter 2, 4. Y'all know I'm getting old. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by the human, chosen by God, and precious to him. You also, living stones, are being built into the spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering special spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. For the scripture says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, chosen in a precious cornerstone, and, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Sometimes you're praying, and they'd be like, what you praying about? Yeah, what you praying? Ain't, ain't nobody here. Ain't nobody here in, you, in your own house. They don't, they, mama, ain't nobody hearing you. Keep praying. 